In this edition of Futurist, 50 years of European scientific research. This March, the European Common Market celebrates its half century. The pooling of resources and ideas made possible by the Treaty of Rome not only gave Europe harmony in trade, but encouraged collaboration on scientific research. Research which gave birth to the world's first supersonic airliner, global mobile telephony standards, and the World Wide Web. Europe can be proud of its research achievements. Its importance to European industry and commerce cannot be overstated, as these French students know. There will be no French research without Europe, the student says. It gives us more research opportunities, in particular when one talks about CERN. It also means there will be more employment opportunities. There are fewer women working in research and less female Nobel laureates too. In the future, I hope there will be more research jobs for women and better wages. The school where these students study, the Higher School of Industrial Physics and Chemistry in Paris, has an illustrious past. Two-time Nobel laureate Marie Curie conducted her research on radium here, and the physicist Paul Langevin was a director of the school. Pierre Papon, former director general of France's largest public research organization, is now the school's emeritus professor. Mon laboratoire était ici, je dirais, dans, dans, dans un sous-sol de ce bâtiment qui a été transformé. Je me souviens qu'il y a une trentaine... My laboratory was here in the basement, though now it's been rebuilt. Of course, we had scientific instruments. They'd been developed 30 years ago. But we had no computer to analyze results, no microprocessors to automate the acquisition of data. It was data processing that revolutionized research, mainly in the experimental fields. Intégrer à une instrumentation scientifique a été un progrès considérable qui a changé en grande partie l'expérimentation. Back then, the road to the future was not well marked. Europe was still reeling from five years of war. Everything needed to be rebuilt. It was a voyage of discovery, I'd say, exploring the great scientific questions in the fields of biology, chemistry, physics and mathematics. Research began through programs inspired by the treaties and supported by European institutions. One of the founders of the European Union announced Europe's intention to follow a constructive path. It was the establishment of the European coal and steel community, an industrial alliance Schumann enthusiastically promoted that marked the beginning of European cooperation. They had the brilliant idea of launching a research program, the first European program on coal and steel. The aim was to improve productivity in coal mines, in the iron and steel industries. They developed new processes such as the manufacture of steel using oxygen-enriched blasts, the use of electricity in steel production. It was a huge success. In 1957, attention turned to the nuclear power industry with the creation of Euratom, the European Atomic Energy Community. Its mission was to coordinate European nuclear research programs and ensure the free flow of ideas. One of the ideas in the 60s was biomedical. The work was carried out in the United Kingdom by Professor Mansfield, who developed a technique of creating imagery by magnetic resonance. You probably know it as MRI. MRI can find a tiny brain tumor, so it's become an invaluable diagnostic tool as well as being very useful in the laboratory. Même fut-elle très petite dans le cerveau, et donc c'est devenu aujourd'hui un outil diagnostique. Et voici la couleur, au jour fixé et à l'heure dite. In the 70s, Europe joined in the conquest of space with the founding of the European Space Agency. 
At the end of the 80s, it was European researchers who developed mobile telephone GSM technology, the most popular standard for mobile phones in the world, with more than 2 billion users in 200 countries. Then around 1990, a researcher in Geneva for CERN, the European Nuclear Research Organization, suggested that it might be possible for everyone in the world to share information with just a click. James Gillis was present at the historic moment. Behind us is the computer that Tim Berners-Lee used in 1990 to write all the basic software of the World Wide Web. It was funny because very few people understood what Tim was trying to say. And it was in March 1989 that he made the first proposal, which was called Information Management a Proposal. And on the cover, it had lots of blobs and circles and boxes and all the arrows linking them together. It's a very short document. And Tim's boss at the time just wrote on the cover, vague but exciting. The World Wide Web found fertile ground at CERN, as have many other ideas. CERN employs 7,000 researchers, and one of its interests now is the mystery of antimatter and the origin of the universe. Physicist John Ellis has been working at CERN since 1973. Science advances by a dialogue between theorists like myself and experiment. And I think the thing which I learned while I was here was how to talk to experimentalists, how to listen to experimentalists, how to work together. Well, sometimes uh, it takes a little bit of uh, adjustment on both sides, but uh, I find it very interesting, very rewarding. I remember one time I was working with a, a young Russian scientist and his way of analyzing a problem was just as if he was playing chess. He would analyze uh, several moves in advance to see what would be the consequences of this and what would happen if we did that. It, it was fascinating and very helpful. It's collaboration between Europe, the United States and Japan that enabled this giant particle accelerator to be built. Called the Large Hadron Collider, its job is to propel atoms at close to light speed. When the atoms collide, they smash apart, recreating conditions similar to those that gave rise to the Big Bang and the origin of our universe. What you expect here is to find uh, one particle which is resp responsible to give masses to the other particle. And if you find this, you can complete one model. But maybe there is also another model which is valid, and then you would find many, many more particles which would open really a new field. The experience with CERN is for Giovanna Davitz unique. There are 36 nations in CMS which work together, so you really work with people all over the world, which is very exciting. And then here at CERN there are experts from all over the fields, so you can just go, you can knock on the door, and then you can enter and ask for like an expert for in this field, hey, how is this and this working, and so on. People are very friendly and very open. So that young researchers like Giovanna have a future, European research has to be adaptable. The European Research Council has allotted 7.5 billion euros for basic research until 2013. In ERC's administrative headquarters in Brussels is President Professor Fotis Kafatos. The mission of the ERC, as we call it, is to promote uh, top quality uh, research in all fields in Europe, with the sole criterion being excellence, not just retour, not uh, uh, compartmentalization to national uh, efforts, but uh, focusing on uh, the top uh, uh, research opportunities uh, for Europe. There are many challenges, such as the competition from the United States and China. I want to sound an alarm. In 2006, the United States spent around $100 billion more than us on basic industrial research. It's a gap which is likely to harm the scientific and technological competitiveness of Europe and also the competitiveness of Europe as a whole. We must spend more so that European research can answer the challenges of the future and to ensure that there will be new Marie Curies in years to come. Europe has achieved a great deal through its research programs over the past 50 years. But times are changing rapidly, and it must adapt itself to these changes if it is to continue to answer the demands of the future.